traveling at 150 miles per hour. U.S. Air Flight 1493 descends toward runway 24 left. What the hell? The aircraft was fully engulfed in flames. At one of the busiest airports in the world, a Boeing 737 has just exploded into flames upon landing. But the full scope of this tragedy is far bigger than anyone can imagine. The Port of Miami, December 19, 2005. Trucks Ocean Airways flies seaplanes in and out of this busy waterway. Today, Flight 101 from Fort Lauderdale is making a brief stopover here on its way to the Bahamas. Michelle Marks is in command of today's flight. She was promoted to captain earlier this year. First Officer Paul DeSanctis joined the airline eight months ago. The Miami seaplane base has no control tower. The crew has to keep a lookout for boat traffic as they taxi through one of the busiest ports in the world. Flight 101 will take off from X-44, a seaplane base near a channel known as Government Cut. Prepare for takeoff. Roger. Ready to take off. Both pilots have their hand on the throttles. It's to prevent the captain from inadvertently pulling back if the plane hits a wave. 45 knots. This is the moment most passengers are paying for, the takeoff. Half speedboat, half plane. It's a unique thrill. 75 knots, 80 knots. For the pilots, accelerating through the waves is often the most difficult part of the flight. But this takeoff goes smoothly. Flight 101 is no longer a boat. It's now a plane en route to Bimini. It's 2.38 in the afternoon. The plane's flight path takes it past South Beach, where sunbathers and surfers are out in force. Just less than a minute into the flight, the Grumman Mallard is climbing through 500 feet, well below the clouds. Then, the plane rolls violently and dives. The pilots barely have time to register what's happening. Their struggles are in vain. By chance, a tourist from New York catches Flight 101's final moments on his camera. 60 seconds after takeoff, the plane slams into the ocean. Two lifeguards are the first rescuers to go looking for the plane. But the effort is futile. All 20 people on board are dead, including pilots Paul DeSanctis and Michelle Marks. Media coverage of the crash gives investigators a very rare piece of evidence. Okay, the video only captured the final seconds of the plane crash, but it confirms eyewitness reports that a wing ripped off in midair. As with most aircraft, the Mallard's wings are built from aluminum alloy. The spars run the length of each wing. In between the spars are stringers that give added support. Together, these parts make up the wing box, which also doubles as a fuel tank. Over the years, the wing box had been repaired many times. Chalk's mechanics had patched up areas damaged by corrosion, which is not unusual for an aging aircraft, especially a seaplane. But when investigators examine the rest of the Chalk's fleet, they find that the Mallards are in far worse shape than they imagined. Years earlier, 
a mechanic had spotted the crack on the lower surface of the wind. He repaired it by drilling a hole in the path of the crack. It's called a stop drill hole. But the stop drill holes didn't work. Even as mechanics put in more holes, the crack kept growing. Investigators now know the right wing was damaged long before the day of the accident. What they don't understand is why the crack could not be stopped. Approved. But a glimmer of an answer comes when they learn the plane was sending out warning signs of a deeper, more serious problem. According to the log, fuel leaks from the right wing were repaired again and again, but they kept happening. Just two days before the crash, it happened again. While doing routine maintenance on the Mallard, a mechanic came across fuel dripping from the right wing. The procedure for plugging a leak was to apply a chemical sealant to the inside of the empty fuel tank. The sealant would take a day to dry. Then the plane could be refueled and returned to service. The leak should have been a clue that the crack in the wing skin was just the tip of the iceberg that there was a much more dangerous problem with the wing's interior structure. Clint Crookshanks examines the pieces that make up the right fuel tank. Some kind of sealant. He wonders why the fuel leaks persisted in spite of the constant efforts to repair them. Okay. Hand me that scraper, please. Thank you. Beneath the layers of sealant, he finds the answer. Bingo. Cracks in a critical support beam called a Z-stringer. It's the piece that the plane's skin was directly attached to. All right, will you finish cleaning this off and then get some pictures, OK? Thank you. Crookshanks finds evidence that Chalk's mechanics had tried to repair the stringer. The broken Z-stringer weakened the entire wing. Now, with every takeoff and landing, the plane's skin was absorbing the forces. Over time, the skin began to crack as well. The final outcome was inevitable. <laughs> Korean Airlines Flight 007 and all 269 people on board have vanished. All efforts to contact the flight have failed. There was concern that it had been either forced to land or crashed, or within hours, the story began circulating in Washington that, that the Soviets had been involved. As the world waits for news about the incident, US military officials make a horrible discovery. At the time of the flight's disappearance, US soldiers heard what they thought was a routine Soviet training mission. It doesn't seem possible that the Soviets would actually shoot down a passenger plane. But American officials have little doubt. The next morning, U.S. Secretary of State George Shultz delivers an unusually blunt statement. The United States reacts with revulsion to this attack. Loss of life appears to be heavy. We can see no excuse whatsoever for this appalling act. 1983 is the height of the Cold War. Russia and much of Eastern Europe are united by communist ideology. Ruled with an iron fist, the Soviet Union is locked in a bitter political struggle with the West. Relations were bad, but no one really knew how bad, how dangerously bad they were. Initially, Soviet officials deny responsibility for the KAL disaster. The story came out of Moscow was that the plane appeared, we intercepted it, tried to make it stop, it didn't, it flew away. That was the first story. But soon they reverse course and come clean. A Soviet fighter jet did, in fact, shoot the plane down. 
but they insist the attack was justified. The Soviet view was that it was on a spy mission, perhaps carrying instruments, cameras, uh, recorders, and so forth. The Soviet Union claims Flight 007 entered highly restricted airspace under orders from the U.S. government. But the U.S. insists KAL-007 was a routine passenger flight. The dispute only heightens political tensions. In a rare move, U.S. officials share highly classified surveillance data from the night of the shootdown. A top secret technology called passive radar can track the movements of every military and civilian plane around the globe. What it reveals about KAL-007 is stunning. The plane was way off course. For almost its entire journey across the Pacific, the flight had been drifting north. By the time it was shot down, Flight 007 was 350 miles north of where it should have been, and had already flown in and out of Soviet territory. The Soviets were telling the truth. And then it becomes a question of determining why was it off course that much. In the months following the KAL disaster, unidentifiable human remains wash ashore in northern Japan. Small pieces of wreckage are also found. Investigators have no doubt that the plane was completely destroyed. Investigators have no clear idea where Flight 007 went down. But there are some people who do. Top Soviet officials are hiding the fact that one month after the incident, not only did they find the wreckage, they also found the all-important black boxes. It was a big pile of debris. They took down this pile with their bare hands until they found the black boxes. There were two of them. But the Soviets keep the boxes to themselves. The information is locked away. until nearly 10 years later. After the turn of the decade brings a jubilant end to the Cold War, Glasnost ushers in a new spirit of openness in Russia. Eager to break with the past, the new administration in Moscow decides to go public. The actual unveiling of the data recorders and black boxes was a total surprise. And suddenly this new material promised, promised some real answers. So I knew they're going to tell me something. I wanted to have the facts from the tapes and then see how does those facts compare to what we wrote in 1983. In 1992, during official ceremonies in Seoul, Russian leader Boris Yeltsin hands over the long-awaited flight recorders. I was approached by KGB general, and he told me that, uh, you probably don't know me, but I have had the recorders for 10 years. I had them in the safe in my office. I knew it was a big international secret. It bothered me tremendously. Every day when I came to the office and I looked at my safe and I knew the recorders were there, he told me, you may not understand that this is the happiest day in my life. Investigators have long suspected that the crew either misprogrammed their navigation system or left it in the wrong mode, set on constant magnetic heading. The flight data recorder finally provides the definitive answer. The data revealed that the aircraft was on constant magnetic heading from soon after takeoff from Anchorage to, to the end. There was no deviation whatsoever in the magnetic heading. The crew of KAL-007 never activated the waypoint navigation system. 
gear up. Let me gear up. It seems they simply forgot a basic step in their standard flight procedure. It's early December. A massive winter storm is pounding the eastern United States. Well, this is a pretty interesting weather pattern we have for this time of year. We're getting uh, a mixed bag of uh, precipitation and, and weather across the eastern United States. For most people, the winter weather is no more than an inconvenience. But for those who fly, the bad weather can be deadly. A Continental Airlines commuter plane with 48 people aboard crashed into a home in suburban Buffalo. No survivors. People are making life and death decisions every day uh, based on the weather. Should I go or should I not go today? And, and once they're up in the air, how am I going to make a decision in the next five minutes that's going to keep myself, my passengers, or my aircraft uh, out of harm's way? On this day, flights from New York to Houston have been delayed and canceled. Thousands of travelers are affected. That's largely because the people in this room have decided that it's unsafe for pilots to fly in this weather. Our mission here is, is to provide safety and safe flying. What's happening now, it's an existing condition, so. It's like some mm -hmm. discreet supercells in there. This room is every pilot's first line of defense against getting caught in a storm. It's the federal government's Aviation Weather Center in Kansas City, Missouri. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the meteorologists in this room scan the skies across the United States for the weather that can bring down a plane. The storm they're tracking today is just that kind of weather. What we're monitoring is a lot of severe weather in the uh, Carolinas and uh, continuing to get severe thunderstorm warnings and tornado warnings there. The meteorologists have detected thunderstorms moving towards Atlanta, Georgia. They've warned pilots and air traffic controllers of the looming danger. The result is immediate. So you had, you had planes that were on the ground that could not take off. Uh, then you had planes that were arriving that were unable to land. And then you have to factor in that they were going several hundred miles around this, this line of thunderstorms. Today, the people who work here have to find a way to keep planes out of the storms that are rolling to the south. As traffic managers, we need to work with the FAA in, in routing safe routes for aircraft to go around those thunderstorms because they just can't go through them or over them. So using these two images together, we can get a, a good three-dimensional or even four-dimensional picture of the atmosphere and how moisture is moving around in there. Thunderstorms are a lethal threat to pilots. The clouds that contain them are massive. They're usually much too tall to fly over, and the weather inside them can be treacherous. In no instance does any aircraft want to go into a thunderstorm. Uh, lightning strikes, hail can certainly damage uh, the airframe, uh, and in, in the extreme cases, there can be so much liquid precipitation in that thunderstorm that it'll cause a jet engine to flame out. The meteorologists here understand the danger of thunderstorms. Tower, Delta 191 Heavy, out here in the rain, feels good. 191 Heavy? We're not getting any bad warnings from the weather or from other pilots, which we rely on as they come through it. As the pilots of Delta 191 prepare for landing, the rain begins to fall harder. At the foot of the runway, one of the most ferocious types of storm clouds stands in their way. Before landing check, landing gear, down three green. At the time, the type of storm the Delta crew is approaching barely has a name. John McCarthy is one of the world's leading experts on these storms. It is a tiny thing, meteorologically speaking, compared to a a big storm or a snowstorm or a hurricane, it's just a, like a needle in a haystack. The needle is a microburst, one of the deadliest and at the time most poorly understood weather phenomena. They've taken down airliners before, but as Delta 191 makes its approach, there are no warning systems that can effectively alert the pilots of the danger they're in. Prior to 1985, the radars on board the aircraft 
were built to detect thunderstorms, uh, essentially heavy areas of precipitation. They were not effective. They were not even designed to detect the microburst. If you're at the kitchen sink and you turn on the water and it goes straight down and it splashes out in all directions. And that's kind of what a microburst is, except that it is extremely bad news if you're an airplane flying through it. When a plane hits a microburst, it encounters a complex and powerful set of conditions. Downdrafts and tailwinds batter a plane. It's a deadly combination. Just short of the runway, Delta 191 flies into the microburst. You're gonna lose it all of a sudden. There it is. Push it up. Push it way up. Way up. Way up. Way up. Hang on to the son of He's gonna crash. Pilots of Delta Flight 191 did their very best to recover from this situation, and it didn't work out. I must have caught sight of him just at the last millisecond, and he cartwheeled into the tank in just an instant, and then, of course, there was fire, not a ball of fire, but a wall of fire. Just 27 people survived the crash of Delta 191. 137 people are killed. After the crash of Delta 191, the Federal Aviation Administration races to develop technology that can prevent microbursts from killing again. If there is one crash that we can look back on now and say, this made things safer because we learned from it, it was Delta 191. By law, Airplane manufacturers must prove their planes can be evacuated quickly and safely. When the 737 was introduced in the UK, Boeing demonstrated that 130 people could get off the plane in just 75 seconds. All um, public transport aircraft are certificated to the same criteria, and that is that uh, the total complement of passengers must be capable of evacuating from the aircraft using half the exits in the aircraft generally one side or the other, within a maximum of 90 seconds. A full Boeing 737 is designed to be evacuated in less than two minutes. More of the passengers on Flight 28 should have been able to get off. But 90 seconds after Flight 28 came to a stop, most of the passengers were still on board. It just seemed to go on forever before they, they started evacuating. And that's when I thought, I'm not going to get off. It's going to blow up with all of us on it. The most important lesson of British Air Tours Flight 28 is that seconds matter. The reason why the evacuation in Manchester wasn't um, achieved in 90 seconds is because the conditions in a real fire evacuation are completely different from the certification conditions. The evacuation of Flight 28 was slowed by the fact that passengers became jammed in the bulkhead opening, separating the main cabin from the galley. We wanted to start to evacuate the passengers, but there's a bit of a bottleneck and nobody was coming forward. But with every second, their odds of surviving are decreasing. Flight 28 is becoming a death trap. 28, you are clear for takeoff. Stop! 137 people are on board this British Air Tours flight. I could see orange flames inside the back of the engine. Within minutes, nearly half of them will be dead. The fire in the cabin had been severe, but should not have been catastrophic. This leaves investigators with two questions. Why did so many people die? And what caused the fire? During a routine inspection a year and a half earlier, Mechanics had found small cracks in some of the combustor cans. Since the repair, there were 11 reports of slow acceleration from the engine that exploded in Manchester. 
A damaged combustor can could have been a reason for the problem. But the log entry led Captain Terrington to believe that the problem had been fixed. Investigators still don't understand how a fire outside the plane spread into the cabin as quickly as it did. Believing he had a blown tire, Captain Terrington made a fateful decision. Stop it. 28 Mike, we are abandoning takeoff. Captain Terrington turned his plane to the right and brought it to a stop. He couldn't have realized that doing so would make the problem far worse. There was a crosswind, a slight crosswind, from the left side of the aircraft that was carrying the fire that was burning from the fuel that was pulled underneath the left wing. It carried that fire aft, rearwards, and took over and under the rear fuselage in between the wing and the tailplane. The wind wrapped the fire around the back of the plane and into the cabin. Investigators have discovered how the fire started and the conditions that caused it to penetrate the cabin. Now, investigator Ed Trimble must solve the biggest mystery surrounding the Manchester accident date to figure out why so many died. Investigators learn that most of the dead were not found in the worst burned parts of the plane. Autopsies will point to the real killer on Flight 28. For investigators trying to solve a plane crash, the most important tool can be the black box. It records every detail in the cockpit and tells investigators about vital conversations. But in the crash of Northwest Airlines Flight 255, it wasn't what investigators heard on the tape, it was what they didn't hear that would lead to an astonishing conclusion. An alarm should have sounded when the pilots tried to take off with their flaps retracted. But for some reason, investigators can't hear it on the cockpit voice recorder. When it activates, it alerts the crew that the aircraft is not in a configuration that's safe for takeoff. Technicians analyze the cockpit voice recorder for more clues, and they find something unusual. The takeoff configuration warning is what would have alerted them about the flaps and slats. Flaps, slats, flaps. It's a warning. It, it's, it's meant to alert you. And if it's going off routinely all the time, it, uh, it gets on their nerves. And uh, so apparently pilots were routinely silencing those takeoff warnings. There's a line here. For the crew, it's been a long day. Another one here about 25 miles wide. Well, if we get out of here pretty quick, we won't have a delay. They've already flown from Minneapolis, Minnesota, to Saginaw, Michigan, and then Detroit. Phoenix is their next stop on the way to Santa Ana, California. The plane's 149 passengers are also eager to leave. Paula Sheehan and her family have been visiting relatives. They're heading home to Arizona. Her daughter, Cecilia, is only four years old. Flight 255 begins moving from the gate to the runway. Northwest 255. But because of the weather. Northwest 255, now exit at Charlie Runway 3 Center. The ground controller gives them a last minute runway change with disastrous results. I prayed that everybody made it, but I thought it was just a small plane because it happened so quickly. I didn't know it was a bigger plane, and it was just awful. Just minutes after impact, paramedic Tim Schroeder is on the scene looking for survivors. I have never been to an accident of that scale. We were struck by the, the, the magnitude of what we were seeing, the, the large scale of it. It was just, it was almost overwhelming. From the little that's left of Flight 255, it is unlikely they'll find anyone alive. It was probably a minute went by and Dan actually heard um, a noise. He asked me a couple times, you know, do I hear anything? And, and I said, no. And then finally I heard it. And it was more like a faint cry. When I turned my head to the right, I saw an arm underneath the seat. One, two. Three, 
She was covered in some blood and some soot. Somehow, four-year-old Cecilia Xian has survived the crash. But she's badly injured. Tim Schroeder races her to the hospital. We have a four-year-old girl found alive in the wreckage. She has a very weak pulse. If Cecilia survived, perhaps others have as well. We can't be sure why the, the little girl survived. Investigator Jack Drake needs to know what contributed to the death of her family and all the other victims. Ladies and gentlemen, we're currently number one for departure. We should be rolling in a couple minutes. Let's do the checklist. Brakes, set, windshield heat, it's on. There are hundreds of small steps for a crew to take to get a passenger jet off the ground. Most of them are covered by checklists. The checklist is a means by which you ensure that important items are positioned or done properly. Looks like bags are all in. Why don't you tell them we're ready to go? 144,000 pounds of passengers and aircraft hurdles down runway 3C. Within 17 seconds, just under 50 feet from the ground, the aircraft begins rolling from side to side. It seems the crew overlooked a very important step. If the crew tried to take off with the flaps retracted, it would be an astonishing blunder. To get the plane off the ground, the flaps on the wings should have been extended to the 11 degree position. But the way the flap handle is damaged suggests the plane's flaps were retracted when it crashed. If the slats are retracted, in, for the most part, if, with today's modern jets, the airplane is not capable of flight. It appears the downing of Flight 255 was caused by pilot error. For some reason, a seasoned crew forgot one of the most basic steps involved in getting an airplane off the ground. The cause of the crash remains a mystery. 18 days into the investigation, the Canadian government appoints Justice Virgil Moshansky to lead a more wide-ranging inquiry into all aspects of the aviation system that might have contributed to the Air Ontario tragedy. The government was looking for an experienced trial judge and preferably one who had an aviation background. Moshansky is an experienced pilot with 13 years on the bench. He will work closely with crash investigator David Rohrer and aviation consultant Frank Black. The new team's first step, assessing the plane's technical systems. The electrical system, the hydraulic system, the fuel system, all of these systems are looked at both in terms of what is their history leading up to the accident and what remnants are remaining at the crash site that can be examined. Clues to a possible system failure arise when Sonia Hartwick recalls a troubling event. As we took off, I noticed that the wings just became a solid sheen of gray, shiny ice. Investigators consult the F-28's manuals to study its de-icing systems. They find that only the wing's leading edges are protected. The aircraft had heated leading edges on the wings. I wonder if the anti-icing system was working. And the heat was provided by bleed air from the compressors on the engine. They found the valves that allow the uh, compressed air access to the leading edges. And they tested the valve to see if it functioned, and it did. The anti-icing system was working. But since it only heats the leading edge, it likely didn't clear ice that formed on the surface of Flight 1363's wings. Investigators suspect that snow and ice buildup, what experts call wing contamination, may have played a major role in the crash. To verify that suspicion, Rohrer and his team meet with engineers from Fox. Thanks for coming. Curious to see what you have. Jack Van Hengst, who was the chief engineer, had extensive aerodynamic studies and data on the effects of contamination on an F-28 airplane. Fokker engineers have run simulations of the crash. 
they were able to get some very good data in terms of the performance of the airplane simulating the type of loads, temperatures, etc. that the Dryden aircraft would, would have been exposed to. Investigators make a crucial discovery about the design of the F-28. Because of the angle of the wings, a very small amount of ice makes the plane susceptible to stalling. They concluded that even the most minute bit of uh, contamination on the wing would uh, disrupt the airflow and cause a loss of lift. Well, that answers a lot of questions. The simulations support what witnesses saw. It just barely got airborne, dropping wings, losing lift, and then hitting trees, decelerating to the point where it broke up. Investigators are now certain that contaminated wings caused the crash. But what's still unclear is why the plane was not de-iced before takeoff. March 10th, 1989. It's 11.39 a.m. at Dryden, Ontario's airport. Light snow falls as Air Ontario Flight 1363 stops in the remote northern community on its way from Thunder Bay to Winnipeg. As First Officer Keith Mills checks on weather conditions, Captain George Morwood returns from making a phone call inside the airport. It's getting worse. What's the latest? And it won't clear till late afternoon. Check that. Quite heavy snow. Looks like it's going to be a bad one. It's still within our takeoff limits. Well, that's good. We got a lot of people who want to make their connectors. Let's hope it holds. Temperatures hover around freezing. Captain Morwood uses the power of engine number two already running to fire engine number one. Morwood and Mills are both highly experienced pilots. However, they've each flown fewer than 100 hours in the Fokker F-28. The multi-million dollar aircraft is the first Air Ontario jet to serve the remote northern Ontario region. 24 minutes after landing in Dryden, Flight 1363 is ready to leave. Finally, an hour behind schedule, the plane taxis to runway 29. Captain Morwood performs a brief engine run-up, heating the engines to rid them of any accumulated snow and ice. Then he begins his roll down the runway. B1. The F-28 reaches its takeoff speed. Rotate. 80 knots. Clearly, there's something wrong. The F-28 struggles to get airborne. The pilots are helpless. 49 seconds after lifting off. Air Ontario Flight 1363 crash lands in the brush, west of runway 29. Forty-five people survive the accident, but 24 people do not, including Captain Morwood and First Officer Mills. Investigators are certain that the crew of Flight 296 mishandled a risky maneuver. Bechet has more questions for the captain. What did you do when you saw the trees? I did what any pilot would do. I tried to climb over them. Investigators learn that in the final moments before the crash, Pick up, go around power. Captain Uslin applied full throttle. Is when I was waiting for the, uh, for the engine to spool up that I realized in front of me there were trees. And I was waiting, 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 waiting. But he claims the engines did not respond. And when they finally kicked in, it was too late. I tell you, the engines did not come on when I gave it full throttle. He's convinced the engines didn't respond quickly enough in the final seconds of the flight. and makes his mission to prove it. He uncovers an Airbus document warning of a defect in the A320, which states that the plane's engine speed could stagnate at low altitude. 
a condition caused by poor airflow. When this occurs, the engine cannot accelerate. But investigators can find no evidence of such a failure in any of the data from the plane. In the five seconds after Captain Asleen applied full power on the thrust levers, the A320 twin engines had begun to spool up, reaching 84% thrust, close to full power, just before the plane hit the trees. When you put from idle to full power, you have the impression that nothing happens for, for a few seconds, you know, and then the power comes. But that was normal, exactly as predicted by the certification. We were able to compare the RPM of the engines from the flight data recorder. There was nothing wrong with the engines, any of the two engines. Chief Investigator Claude Bechet has a new headache. Captain Uslane is convinced there is a conspiracy against him. He cuts off all cooperation with the investigation. The investigation committee, I tried to cooperate with them, but I began to be suspicious. And the press, each week, the aircraft is, is good, the aircraft has nothing, pilot error, pilot error, pilot error. All that was a big, big, big cover-up, my opinion. Captain Asseline begins a campaign to challenge the French investigation. He appears on British television to make a dramatic assertion. When I pull the stick to up position, the flight control, the elevator control, go to down position. So on any aircraft, if you ask up, following the order of the pilots, the elevator control goes to up. And not that on that one, it went to down. Why? That would be the good question. His accusations go to the heart of doubts about the aircraft. That Airbus's fly-by-wire system had given the A320's computers too much control. Asseline's claim that the plane didn't follow his instructions is supported by data from the plane's flight recorder. The black box recorded every movement of the pilot's side stick controller. It does show that seconds before the crash, Captain Asseline pulled it back to get the plane's nose up. Investigators compare it with what the plane did in response. They make a perplexing discovery. He's telling the truth. The elevator moved down. Captain Michel Asseline is one of Air France's most distinguished pilots. He's the head of pilot training for the company's newest plane, the Airbus A320. I was in charge of the launching of the 320 in Air France. The company used me to promote the aircraft. The speeches to make, I was constantly on the, on the, on the television, on the newspaper. The aircraft is booked to perform a low-altitude flyover at a local air show. It's only a five-minute flight to Absheim Airfield, where the air show is being held. For this sleepy Alsatian town, the air show is the highlight of the summer. The air show drew more than 5,000 people. There was significant interest from the public. Many passengers have friends and family watching from the ground. Air Charter 296, good afternoon. Absheim, hello. We are coming into view of the airfield for the flyover. Yes, I can see you. You're cleared. The sky is clear. Gear down. Flight 296 makes a gentle turn to line up with a runway. The pilots must now lose more altitude and speed to get into position for the flyover. 200. Mesdames et messieurs, votre attention, s'il vous plaît. L'Airbus A320 arrive. For us, Lean, this will be the most delicate part of the maneuver. He must keep the plane in a stable position, with the nose up, but not too high. I looked at the ground and said, look, he's not high enough, because you can see the grass right out your window. OK, I'm OK there. Disconnect auto throttle. He disables one of the plane's safety features so that the computer won't speed up the slow-moving plane. Only now, Captain Asseline sees something that makes his blood run cold. 
There's a forest in the path of Captain Usling's plane. 30. Pick up, go around power. He selects the highest thrust setting and pulls back on the controls, expecting the aircraft to pull up. But the plane keeps dropping. Can be. J'ai commencé à voir par le hublot des branches d'arbres. I started to see through the window tree branches. I was astonished. You can imagine being on a trail in a large vehicle, a bumpy trail, driving at 80 or 100 kilometers an hour, and you're shaking from all sides. It was like that. I was saying to myself, the plane has to stay in one piece, because if the plane stays whole, we'll be okay. If it breaks up, we're done for. Still full of fuel, the right wing of the jet is sheared off. The fuel ignites immediately on impact. We stopped very quickly. And on the ground, I broke my seat, just because I was holding very firmly. I broke my seat, and I could see my lot of flames all, all over. The first officer is badly injured. And he has a lot of blood. And even with the full harness, he hit something in front of him. What the hell have you done? I don't know. I don't understand. June 30th, 1956. Los Angeles International Airport. TWA Flight 2 takes off eastbound for Kansas City. The TWA flight is a Lockheed Super Constellation one of the most advanced commercial airliners of its time. Just minutes behind TWA Flight 2, United Airlines Flight 718 takes off from the same airport on its way to Chicago. The system to track both of the planes is far from high tech. The Air Traffic Control Center consisted of a room with a map spread out on a table, and the air traffic controllers were moving markers on that map to indicate where each airplane was in its last known position. The pilots radio their position to company dispatchers. Controllers use this information to get a rough idea of their flight plans. They were on radar for a while in Los Angeles, but once they got outside that area, there was no radar. Uh, they were flying under visual flight rules. Uh, the rule is called see and be seen. So I see you, you see me, we stay apart, and we're responsible for our own separation. As the two planes get closer to the Grand Canyon, the distance between them disappears. Both captains were used to showing the canyon off on a clear day. They could move the airplane to the left, move it to the right a little bit, point out the canyon to people, and get them to ooh and off. The United flight closes in on the TWA plane from the right, unaware their paths are about to cross. People make mistakes. It's a lesson the airline industry has learned the hard way. A lesson that fundamentally shaped how planes travel across the skies today. Mistakes can be made for a number of reasons. The tools controllers use to track them are inadequate. Controllers have been complaining about the radars for a long time. The failing system is putting passengers at risk. Labor Day weekend, 1986. Approach controller Walter White guides Aeromexico Flight 498 in for a landing at Los Angeles International Airport. The airspace around LAX is very tightly controlled. It's called the TCA, the Terminal Control Area. As Aeromexico Flight 498 closes in on the airport, Walter White sees a plane he does not expect on his radar. OK, you are right in the middle of the TCA, sir. Roman 66 Romeo, I suggest in future you look at your TCA chart. Walter White hustles the small plane out of the controlled airspace. But White doesn't realize that there's another plane dangerously off course. 124, decimal 9 or 5, thank you. Captain Christian Hecke and First Officer Joel Cherubin 
are experienced pilots with over 12,000 hours of flying time between them. The flight is a short hop between Lyon and central France and the city of Strasbourg in the mountainous Alsace region. The crew is flying an Airbus A320, one of the most technologically advanced commercial airplanes in the world. Cockpit of the A320 is also very different from other planes. Instead of analog gauges, the pilots look mostly at digital displays. Even before takeoff, the pilots program the autopilot to land on a specific runway in Strasbourg. The captain initiates the landing sequence. Flaps towards two. Flaps towards two. Flaps at two. Gill down. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to land in a few minutes. Hakei notices that the plane is traveling too fast, so he extends the speed brakes. They disrupt airflow over the wing, which helps create more drag to slow the plane. We have to watch our descent. As it circled the mountain, the plane inexplicably entered a dangerously steep and rapid descent. But before the crew can adjust their course, the A320 has flown into the side of a mountain. The crash is catastrophic. Just minutes from Strasbourg Airport, an Airbus A320 slams into a mountaintop. Delta Alpha, your position? Flight 148 is no longer on radar, nor responding to radio contact. There are survivors. <laughs> I'm not panicking because I'm going to burn. With the smell of licking jet fuel in the air, the survivors move away from the burning plane. But they are still in grave danger. It's bitterly cold. We stay together, waiting for the first aid but the wait will be longer than anyone might expect. And what they don't realize is that no one knows where they are. They could be anywhere in there. And expect this in the, in the jungle or the rainforest, but not in a highly populated area. Officials need to pinpoint the crash site, but it's not as easy as it might seem. The airport's radar is not recorded. There has been no signal from the plane's emergency beacon. And surprisingly, no one has reported seeing a plane go down. Landing at LAX can be a challenge for pilots. The airspace around the airport is often thick with traffic. On average, a plane arrives or departs every 50 seconds. Each of its four runways handles both takeoffs and landings. Taxiways intersect the runways at dozens of locations. The airport can be a maze of stops and starts for pilots following instructions issued by controllers. Local controller Robin Washer is overseeing the two north runways at LAX, 24 left and 24 right. The investigation into the deadly collision on runway 24 left focuses on Robin Washer's conversations with the two planes involved. The answer will raise alarming questions about the safety of all passengers flying to and from LAX. The air traffic control tapes reveal that Robin Washer instructed both the SkyWest Metroliner and the U.S. Air Flight to use runway 24 left at the same time. NTSB investigators now know that human error played a major role in the collision at LAX. This, is, this situation that occurred is a, is a situation that no controller wants to go through. You train your whole uh, career for this not to happen. And when it does happen, it's, uh, you can't even describe the feelings that you go through. A situation like this could potentially happen to anybody. We are all human. After the accident, Washer left her job at LAX and never worked as an air traffic controller again. 
518, taxi across runway 24 left. February the 1st, 1991. Los Angeles International Airport, LAX. 246, heading 270, contact Los Angeles departure. Thank you, US Air 1493. You're cleared to land, 24 left. Cleared to land, 24 left, 1493. Traveling at 150 miles per hour, US Air Flight 1493 descends toward runway 24 left. What the hell? I pointed to the aircraft and yelled, U.S. Air is crashing. The aircraft was fully engulfed in flames. At one of the busiest airports in the world, a Boeing 737 has just exploded into flames upon landing. But the full scope of this tragedy is far bigger than anyone can imagine. Amid the wreckage, they have made an alarming discovery. The discovery of a propeller has horrifying implications. There's two planes down here. My first thought was, oh my god, there was someone else under there, and we didn't even realize it. Emergency personnel find parts of the smaller plane strewn across runway 24 left. There were 12 people on board the flight. None have survived. What's left of their plane is crushed between U.S. Air 1493 and an abandoned building near the runway.